to the Community Forum on Climate Justice. Uh, we have, we're trying to do a lot in a short amount of time, so we're just gonna get started. Um, I'm Abigail, I work with PCAST, the Portland Central America Solidarity Committee, and we are co-sponsoring this event with a bunch of other great groups in town, uh, BOSE, AFSC, uh, Cocoon, Opal, Rising Tide, and Jobs with Justice. I don't think I'm forgetting anyone. Um, and I'm just going to start out with kind of a quick introduction to the forum and some context about uh, why we're here, talking about climate justice. I'm going to be co-facilitating tonight along with Shizuko. Um, and then we will get to our panel. Um, so there's a lot of really amazing organizations who are here tonight. Um, people are doing some great work locally around immigrant rights and racial justice and um, public transit and a uh, healthy environment. And this is all really amazing work that's really critical to the well-being of all of our communities. Uh, and it keeps us really busy. So it's often hard to find time for us to come together and just take a step back to reflect on kind of where we're at in a broader movement building sense and where we're going. Uh, and so that is really kind of the impetus for why we organized this forum. We wanted to just create a space for us to come together and really have that dialogue with each other and take the time. Um, so at PCAST, we take our lead a lot of times from social movements in Latin America that are doing great work that we really respect. Um, and the Zapatistas have a saying about, you know, a movement of movements and a world that contains many worlds. And I think the global movement for climate justice has really kind of taken its cue from that. And in many ways, it really is a movement of movements and that it includes a lot of different struggles, uh, not all of which are explicitly environmental, but all are definitely impacted by and have relationships to climate change and the climate crisis. Um, so climate justice originally is a concept that came out of the environmental justice movement uh, with the recognition that climate change uh, while it will affect all of us, it's not going to affect everyone equally. And the people who are hardest hit by climate change, as with many other things, uh, are going to be the poor, communities of color, women, indigenous people, you know, and there, and there are more. Um, so real solutions to climate justice need to take this into account and uh, craft solutions that actually address all of these, you know, systematic oppressions and um, address the climate crisis in a way that doesn't sort of leave anyone out. Um, so that's why, you know, coming together in this way with all our different sort of organizations and campaigns is really uh, important. So we just, you know, again, are creating that space to really hear each other and um, also to kind of engage in the places where we disagree. I think we do have a lot of common ground. There's a lot, um, you know, that we've already established that we do agree on, that we have in common. Um, and there are also points of disagreement that I think are worth kind of talking to each other about. Because um, often where we disagree, we actually can learn a lot from each other. Those are the spaces where uh, it's really great to um, be able to be present and, and just hear each other. Um, so we are going to be engaging in a bunch of different issues tonight. Uh, we have an excellent panel of folks here who are working on a wide variety of issues, uh, some of which I mentioned earlier and we'll get into a little bit more here in a minute. Um, so we're going to hear from them just kind of briefly to kind of frame the conversation that we're hoping to have tonight and then we're actually going to spend the bulk of our time together in small group uh, breakouts so that we can have a really kind of participatory dialogue and draw on the experience and knowledge of everyone here because there's a lot here in this room um, and I really appreciate that and I appreciate you all for coming and making time to come out and have this dialogue. Um, so I think with that I will hand it off to Shizuko to go over our structure for the event. <laughs> <laughs> so um, hi my name is Shizuko. Um, it's an uh, honor and a pleasure to be uh, helping to co-facilitate this um, tonight's event. Um, so just a quick agenda review. We're going to hear from the panelists um, and then we're going to break into small group discussions. We're going to break into eight separate groups. 
Um, and then those eight separate groups will meet back in two groups of four, so two groups of four, and they'll do um, report back. So we'll have two sets of report backs, one upstairs and one downstairs. Um, and the report backs will be around a set of questions that each group will be um, discussing in their small group. Um, and then we will reconvene in a big group, um, and we're just going to review some of the key um, points that were brought up in the small group discussions and get a sense of what people think about the event, what people think about um, potential opportunities to work together um, or potential opportunities to just sort of move this work forward. So that's what we're doing this evening. <clears throat> um, we have a set of ground rules that I'm going to review very quickly. Obviously, um, you probably won't have to utilize them during the panel. Maybe the panelists will use them, but they're more for the small group discussions. So first, if folks could just be aware to be respectful um, in, in terms of communicating ideas and in terms of interacting with each other. The second one, super important. It's called step up, step back. And we're all very excited about what we're talking about and we love what we're doing and what we're talking about when we talk and 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 everybody's <laughs> listening and listening and listening and all of a sudden, you know, you just took up all the space. <clears throat> so the idea with Step Up, Step Back is that we are trying to create a space for dialogue and part of that process is sort of being really conscious about what you're saying and how you're sharing the space and time that we have together um, in these groups to, um, with each other. Um, and also, in terms of step back, if you're somebody who doesn't talk a lot, um, who tends to be super shy, we really encourage you to share your ideas because we want you to participate. Um, raise your hand to speak. It's just logistically much easier. No interrupting. Um, please practice listening, listening actively. And then also um, be aware there are diverse perspectives in the room and that we should really try to um, respect each other and those diverse perspectives um, because the, we're a movement of movements, and, not, and all movements aren't necessarily always aligned, and so it really is about bringing together ideas that might be similar, might be different, but at the end of the day, we're moving forward with our, our similarities and our differences. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the ground rules. Um, panelists, I am going to be really strict with you, but I'm going to need your help, because um, I'm going to use, um, my, I don't have flashcards, so I'm going to give you guys two minutes, and I'm going to give you one minute, and I'm going to give you zero. And I will actually shout over you if you go over zero. Um, <coughs> so be aware. I have, I have no shame. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to introduce each of you, um, and, then, um, and then you can speak. Because we all are going to want to clap for hours and hours and hours after every single panelist speak, um, that might actually mess up our schedule. So I'm going to ask folks to use the twinkle if you agree with folks, and just to show support for general, um, general things. And at the end, we will get everybody a big round of applause, and they'll get what they need, and we'll see. Okay. okay, cool. Are we ready to start? Okay, cool. So we're starting at this end. Uh, apparently, there's a scale of like, like, just depression to like hope. So <laughs> just <laughs> you guys. <clears throat> but isn't it nice we're moving towards hope? I think that's a great. <laughs> so um, our first panelist is Ian Wallace. He's a member of the Parasol Climate Collective. He's a construction worker that has been involved with social justice work in Portland for the last 15 years. And I have brought my own timer. All right. Reach you to the punch. Um, so I was asked to speak a little bit about um, sort of the situation that we're facing and what climate change is and why it's happening. And I'm sure there's a lot of folks that have studied it uh, in this room as well. But I'll take a couple minutes to just sort of uh, discuss the, the process that's occurring. Um, and, and then maybe take a few moments to think about the implications to that on the work that we're, we're doing. Um, so essentially, for the last 10,000 years or so, we've had a fairly stable climate called the Holocene. And that climate is um, what sort of led, the, led to the ability to develop agriculture on large scale. Essentially laid the groundwork for a movement from you know, hunting and gathering societies to agricultural societies. I'm not making a judgment on the relative value of, of those societies. But um, this is the climate regime that created the circumstances that resulted in where we are today. And um, 
that equilibrium is based on what's called the greenhouse effect, which was earlier used as a way to describe global warming or climate change. But the greenhouse effect is essentially what keeps our planet warm. As solar energy radiates from the sun, it hits the face of the planet and bounces off the face of the planet back into space. But our atmosphere, which is made up of a bunch of different gases, carbon dioxide being one of them, trap some of that heat in our atmosphere. And it's what heats the planet that, uh, that allows this to be something that looks like Earth and not like Mars. Um, this has changed over the course of you know, the history of the planet many times uh, on, from a variety of factors. Um, the factor that's changing it now is carbon dioxide that's being pumped into the atmosphere because of industrial production. Um, what that is resulting in is a heating planet. Now, lots of times we think of, oh, well, this is a problem. We've got a heating planet. We're going to have to, like, you know, figure out how to deal with that fact. What is sort of less understood, I think, is the, like, the tendency of, of motions that are objects that are in motion to either stay in motion or, or, or quit moving. Inertia, right? So we have a trend towards a heating planet, which is creating a self, uh, a positive feedback cycle that is sort of threatening to put us in a situation of runaway climate change, where the systems that maintain our planet in this equilibrium are being destabilized enough so that they're no longer going to maintain that equilibrium on a pretty fundamental basis. So examples of this would be the polar ice caps, right? Which, if you think about a car on a hot day, a white car is cooler to the touch than a, than a black car, and that's because the white reflective surface radiates heat much more efficiently back away from it. So the polar ice caps melting just gives us a larger surface area that instead of radiating heat back is a blue ocean that sucks heat into it. So this is a part of a self-fulfilling uh, process that <coughs> contributes to a runaway climate. The other things would be for the heat increases the likelihood of forest fires, which reduces the carbon uh, capacity of trees to take carbon and sequester it out of the atmosphere. And uh, additionally, a forest fire dumps carbon into the atmosphere. So there's these several self-reinforcing cycles that we're starting to trend towards that could push us towards a planet that hasn't been uh, something that has been here for, you know, five or six million years. Like, it's quite a different planet that we're moving into, and probably not one that human civilization is capable of living on. Well done. 15 seconds to spare. <laughs> Great. Our next speaker is... Um, that was surprising. <laughs> is Carrie Coe, who is a longtime community organizer and Portland Central American Solidarity Committee member, who will be giving an update from the People's Movement Gathering at Rio Plus 20 in Brazil, which she attended as part of a delegation with the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. Thanks. So, um, the uh, People's Summit in Rio uh, essentially was a coming together of social movements from around the world to talk about development of which climate change is a key factor. Um, so what I want to talk about is a little thing called the green economy, because that was the primary point of discussion at this forum. Um, so 30,000 people came together to essentially um, discuss the fact that the UN um, and the countries that are involved with the UN are moving forward a program to um, develop the world called the green economy. And while many of us, myself included, for the last decade or so have thought about green in terms of sustainability and recycling and good stuff, the reality is, is that that term and the, what that term implies has been completely taken over by the interests that simply want endless growth across the planet. Um, and that, you know, how we see this in our lives is the Coca-Cola bottle that's like 10% less plastic, green. Um, and that that's really what it means, right, is these small tweaks to the existing system that simply reinforce 
the, the power structure, the wealth dynamics, and the trajectory that we're on that Ian described. So the green economy is essentially you know, an economic global free market where um, every single thing can be bought and sold. So um, you know, we see this in water. There's a lot of famous um, you know, anecdotes about how water is being bought and sold. But that includes not only water, but air, soil, you know, the DNA that lives inside of us. These are all things that the green economy seeks to put on the market to buy and sell. And the implications of that are extremely dire, right? That we, in fact, on a global level, are not thinking about the way that we're transitioning into a new model that can actually stop climate change or mitigate or affect it, but we're just moving full speed ahead under the guise that we're doing something different with a prettier face, a prettier package. Mm -hmm. It's still based on the concept of limitless growth on a finite planet. Mm -hmm. The other piece of this from the international perspective is that this idea of the green economy is still about imperialism. It's still about the Western countries, people from the global north, corporations from the global north imposing an economic model across the globe in a homogenous way. So what works in Switzerland, they're going to try to make work in Bolivia. What works in China, they're going to try to make work in Australia. And it's the same homogenous reality that has gotten us to where we are today. And this is a, you know, a, a global north concept that is es essentially continuing the imperialist and neoliberal um, imposition onto our comrades in the global south. The other piece of the green economy is that it is the same institutions, corporations, and governments that created the problem sitting at the table with us and telling us that they have the solutions. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that they are not going, just the nature of the economic model is that they're never going to create a solution that is not in their interest, right? That's not the nature of capitalism. That's not the nature of corporations. And so the fact that those are the folks that the global world is looking to for solutions is inherently flawed. So this is the green economy. This is what the world is putting on the table as the solution. Um, and what we saw, what I saw in Rio and what I saw at the People's Summit is the complete rejection of that. That this is not an economic model that we want to engage with, that we want to continue with, and we need to create alternatives and then also demand that our you know, governments opt out of it in whatever way we can. What, we, what it looks like in the US, um, what the green economy actually looks like, for instance, is this um, in Richmond, California, there's a big Chevron plant um, or a factory of some sort. They produce massive amounts of um, problematic things into the air. People have been fighting against it forever in the Bay Area for the last decade or so. That um, just entered into a green economy model program where they now can continue to pollute in Richmond, that they have bought trees in Chiapas that will offset their pollution in California. This is a model program of the green economy and that is what it looks like, that corporations continue on their trajectory, buy into these programs that supposedly you know, offset what they're doing and call that the new economic model of the day. This is what we're dealing with. So what we actually need is a transitional economic model that not only addresses what we have needs for now in our society, but challenges the fundamental systems that created the problems, right? We need something to transition us into a new economic model. Some people call it a solidarity economy. Some people call it buen vivir, which is like the good life. What we need is that transitional program. We see folks from the global south putting forward some, um, some kind of solution options. And I don't have time to tell you what those are. But one thing that I will say is that um, in the US, one thing that we have to look at, and one thing that was brought up time and time again, is our, is our military and the way that that engages, not just in pushing a war agenda, but the fact that the Pentagon is the number one consumer of petroleum in the world, mm -hmm. and the fact that that money, if we're really looking at how we can reinvest our economy, that money is critical to being able to do that, right? So we need to connect the dots, and that's why um, forms like this are important. Thanks. I give you a uh, yes, 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Our next speaker is Brian Frank, who has been an active who has been active in environmental and social justice causes for the past 15 years and is a founding member of Rising Tide North America. Before founding Rising Tide, he spent six months in New Orleans doing volunteer relief work. While well, he got a view of the damage climate change can do and how poor people and people of color are affected by so-called natural disasters. Brian believes that, the only, by, that only by merging environmental and social justice movements into a common resistance movement against corporate power and resource colonialism can society be turned away from its catastrophic course. I, I, I apparently missed the, the uh, word limit guidelines on the uh, I'll, I'll, I'll subtract a few seconds for that. Um, so, 
Carrie covered some of the topics I was going to cover too. Um, I was just talk about a little bit more in depth on the topic of false solutions to climate change. Um, the green economy is sort of a general framework for some of these false solutions, this new term, the green economy. Um, but we are absolutely awash in them throughout um, our economy, and they are expanding extremely rapidly. Um, rising t uh, I work with Rising Tide to publish a booklet. Uh, it's an overview of false solutions. So if this topic is interesting to you, um, our website, you can find it on there in the publication section for Rising Tide's website. Um, just in the two years since we've published the second edition, we could probably add you know, another little two or three chapters to it. And two years before that, we added four, four chapters between them. So these things are expanding really rapidly as well, um, constantly. So to talk about what I'm talking about here, um, we're talking about things like clean coal. Uh, it is the idea that you can uh, take coal from uh, blowing up mountains or from underground mining. Uh, and access in the coal seams, then wash the coal in some sort of way before broadcasting it into the atmosphere. Or that you can capture the pollution from the coal um, at the point at which it's burned and then in some way sequester or bury that, that carbon pollution underground. Um, this, besides being a somewhat dangerous idea in a lot of ways, uh, doesn't have any impact on the um, poisoning impacts of coal. Um, so th this is sort of the general tenor of a lot of the way these false solutions work is that they purport to do something to help the climate or protect the environment in some sort of way, but they have um, drawbacks or problems that uh, either exacerbate the problem or really just cover up the problem completely. Uh, nuclear power is another great example. I think we've all been familiar in the last uh, year and a half with some of the problems with nuclear power. Uh, natural gas is another big one. This has been a huge expansion in the last few years, the amount of natural gas production that's been poisoning uh, water sources around the country, leading to earthquakes and things like that. Um, and natural gas, uh, although it itself is, uh, burns cleaner than coal or oil, uh, there is often natural gas that escapes uh, in the mining process, releasing methane to the air, which is a more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Um, and natural gas is tankered all around the world, and that burns oil, or natural gas is tankered around the world. So there's issues there, too. Um, we also have uh, problems with some alternative energies uh, that are not fossil fuels, like burning garbage uh, for energy, releasing lots of toxins in the air, become, but it's becoming increasingly popular and touted as part of the green economy, uh, the burning of garbage, the burning of uh, waste biomass and things like that as well. Um, agricultural, uh, pr the production of biofuels like ethanol um, is another one that leads to deforestation. Um, of course, the carbon stored in forests uh, is uh, extremely important to the overall cycling of carbon in the atmosphere. So if you cut down forests to create fuel, that's not going to work so good. And of course, it also is increasing food prices around the world as well. Um, some of, they, they get, um, they kind of get worse from there. Um, and all of this, you know, whether we're talking about crazy schemes like dumping lots of iron in the ocean to increase the amount of algae that would be sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, or creating clouds, more and more clouds in the atmosphere to uh, increase the albedo effect and broadcast um, the sun, uh, reflect the sun back in the atmosphere. These are all dangerous ways of uh, manipulating our climate. And all of these things are quick fixes that people are trying to do instead of actually uh, dealing with the problems um, directly. Um, the thing that we need to do uh, is focus on the root cause of climate change which is keeping the fossil fuels in the ground, uh, protecting ecosystems, um, and having communities in control of their resources instead of the model of resource colonialism that we have set up uh, with corporations controlling all the resources that we have. Um, we need to fight for a system that addresses climate change through recognizing human rights, that recognizing these root causes, and recognizing the great long time injustice that's been perpetuated from the rich countries onto the poor ones and deals with reparations for some of those in, uh, injustices um, and transfers of wealth and technology to deal with the impacts of climate change that are uh, now starting to become very serious around the world. So we'll leave it at that. Um, our next speaker is <clears throat> Eruvia Valladares Carranza II, who was born in Querétaro, Mexico, and moved to the US when he was 17. He is now a leader with PECUN, the Pineros y Capaceros Unidos del Noroeste, 
Oregon's Farm Worker Union, and is overseeing the construction of a new low power building for Pekun's FM community radio station. The mission of the radio station is to mobilize the Latino community in the Willamette Valley for civic engagement and to raise the consciousness of the Latino community. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, <clears throat> and one of the projects that we're doing is we're building a, a Passy House cert certified building, which means that it's a very low intake to be able to heat up and cool off your, your building itself. You pretty much take a professional home. 10% 10, 10 of that, that's what we use. And that's what makes a Passy House cert uh, certified. And this is from Europe. It's a concept that needs to be able to be more efficient with your home. Because in the United States, we don't have efficient homes. We have very leaky, very uh, excess all the heat and all the cold in our homes, and that's why we waste a lot of money. So that's why we, uh, not, that's not why we're building a building like that, but we're building a building that is, is a capacity leadership institute, and we're going to uh, help increase our capacity, build our leadership capacity. We're going to do that by uh, bringing in uh, people or our community itself to, to use popular education to be able to get that kind of knowledge that we already earned for years of working with the community and we're going to uh, transmit it. And so that's a popular education way of re-educating ourselves on how to do that. And one of the questions is like, why not have this kind of a caliber building in the Portland Pearl uh, district? Why not there? Why in Woodburn? Why immigrants are in charge of this? Why are they using 1,300 uh, volunteers to do such a thing? So we're using power, uh, volunteer power. And over 1,300 volunteers already have touched this project. And that's what I'm doing. That's my, my, my job. Um, and before I continue, I just want you to do something with me. Um, I want you to draw a line on whatever piece of paper, imagine a line. Um, and the line seems, is, is going to symbolize the, the, the Willamette River. Now, on that line, put the direction of which the, the, the river goes to. Go ahead. Just put, it, put the direction that, that, that the river goes to. Who of you that put the line, the river goes down south? No way. So you know your direction. <laughs> <laughs> which means that a lot of people that I have asked these questions, they're like, well, it goes down. No. It goes up, it goes to the north. And which means is if you want to clean up the river, you have to start in Eugene, somewhere there, because that's where you're bringing all your pollutions to here. So that's one of the concepts that I have learned that people don't really understand what is this topography, demographic, demography, uh, demography and, and where do they live, what place they live in. So that's uh, something that I want to talk about. Sustainability is a word that we use in many different ways. And one of the examples that I have is there is a lot of workers doing helping out building a nice building, but on this building, uh, the workers don't have a driver's license. I don't know if you know, but there's a law of the past, and, and a lot of people that cannot prove uh, citizenship cannot have a driver's license. And that's not sustainable. If you think that you, you can build a building with sustainability and not have this, it's wrong. And that's what we talk about. And so one of the things that I learned is that this, what I call greenwash, is how the capitalist, of, of the capitalist way of doing business in the United States is mimicking and taking the words of organic, taking the words of hybrid, sustainable, and just using those words to be more compatible and attractive to the, to the new uh, uh, stream that is going, which is about sustainability, about green, about doing less uh, 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 footprint, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So that's the main reason why, and also when you think about it, it's a it's style of life. The style of life that we have in the United States is sold worldwide, which is comfortable. You live in a nice house, you have your car, and, you, you, I, and when you live in the United States, you see a whole different reality. But when you're in Mexico, when you're in other nations, that's what they, you've been fed, and that's, and that's what people are like, I want that. And that happened in 1944 with the Bracero program. And so... Today, I was listening on the radio, and it's a whole generation today, in 2012, that is natural deprivation syndrome, which means they don't know how a tomato is grown. They don't know how broccoli is grown, which is, we have to think, rethink that how we are rewiring our, our, our generations for our future. So my, 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 my 50 cents on this is that if we want to tackle the climate change problem, we need to look at the social problem. 
We cannot change the climate change problems without having a, so a social problem fixed. We have more than 5 million uh, immigrants that are in the United States now recognized. We have the President Obama put the executive order to the dreamers, the people that be here before they, before they could understand what, what was happening. So that's the reality that I see and I can bring to the table is you cannot look at the, the problems that we have climate, with the climate without changing the social. And I say that because if you ask a farm worker, why do you buy a used car? Because it's cheap and it takes me from point A to point B. Why not buy a, uh, what, $50,000 hybrid car? Uh, it's not cheap. <laughs> so it, 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 those are the realities that we face and why not, so I'll say that. Oh, what for what? Uh, <coughs> um, uh, no, you can, no, sorry. You can watch Operator and now it's a document. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, our next panelist is Barbara Bird, who teaches, that was actually really hard, you guys. Okay, um, Barbara Bird, who teaches at the Labor Education and Research Center at the Uni University of Oregon in Portland. She also serves as the Secretary Treasurer of the Oregon AFL-CIO, where she works to build connections between labor, environmental organizations, and the low-income community. Thanks, and uh, it's great to be on this panel with these really smart people. Um, I'm supposed to talk about jobs. So let me start with a story, and I've told this story before. If you've heard it before, I apologize. Um, last summer, a team of people showed up at my house to weatherize it. Um, there were five of them. One was a Latino male who just graduated from the Portland Youth Builders Program. Four were graduates of Oregon Tradeswomen's Training Program. Um, and all of them were new members of the Laborers Union. Uh, they were employed by a minority-owned contractor. So if they had been working in regular residential weatherization, they would have been earning probably minimum wage, no benefits, but they were part of the Clean Energy Works Oregon program that's been set up. And because of that, because of the standards that are in effect in Clean Energy Works, they were doing green jobs, they were earning a family wage, they were earning health benefits for the first time in their lives, all five of them. They did good work, um, now paying lower electricity bills, and my carbon footprint is smaller. Uh, and, and I feel good about that. And I tell this story because I think it illustrates the, the point I want to make here that's absolutely crucial when we talk about climate change and jobs, and that is that we can't talk about green jobs as though there's the solution to something. Um, in fact, not all green jobs are good jobs. Regular residential weatherization work is crappy work. The pay is low. Same thing with, with recycling, sorting recycling prod products by hand. Crappy work, low wages. Um, and, and according to the Oregon Employment Department, in fact, a third of all green jobs pay under $15 an hour. That's not the, what I want to build an economy around. The workers who weatherized my home were paid a family wage because of the work of a large group of stakeholders involved in clean energy works unions, community groups, minority contractors, environmental organizations, who negotiated for eight months and came up with a high road agreement that was put into place under that program that with wage and benefit requirements and also affirmative action hiring requirements. We can't expect green jobs to be good jobs unless we put that kind of intentional effort into the work. In our system, our capitalist system, and I totally agree with what Carrie was saying, um, employers hire who they want to hire, uh, for whatever they want to pay them, and there's no standards. So we've got to pay more attention to that issue. And, and it's the power, I think, of alliances between labor and environmentalists in particular um, that, and low-income communities that we could put that program together and convince the state of Oregon to fund it. Working together to impact climate change and provide opportunities to women and people of color and to create good green jobs, that's path-breaking. And that's the kind of project we need to be involved in. The bad news now is that, and as you all know, increasingly climate justice advocates and the labor movement are being forced apart. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, not a lot of public money left anymore for these kinds of programs. The unemployment rate's stuck at 8.4%. Um, and the, um, that percentage doesn't even adequately capture what's going on, the misery people are facing, losing their homes and their marriage mm -hmm. and their health. Um, it's tough times out there. In the building trades unions that I work with a lot, 30 to 40 percent of their members are out of work. Um, if they're going to support themselves um, and their families, they have to go where the jobs are. Telling them that there's going to be a lot of green jobs down the road, so they'll hold out for those, and you're going to cut it 
when they need to put food on the table. I know these workers, I know the leaders of their unions, if they had a choice, they'd rather do green jobs, they'd rather help the environment, they'd rather be part of the solution for climate change and not part of the problem. Right now they don't feel like they have a choice. And so when you hear these guys talking about wanting to build coal export terminals, just keep in mind that that's what's going on for them. The jobs issue has to be a central part of this conversation about climate change. We can't just ignore it and, and, and slough it off with sort of easy solutions. My hope is that we can talk together about dealing with climate change and how to create good jobs while we're doing that. Um, we need to make job creation real and not just pie in the sky. We can't draw lines in the sand and give up on each other. And, um, and I really believe that we have to be in this for the long haul. In the long term, none of us wins unless all of us win. Mm. Um, and our final and hopefully very inspiring speaker <laughs> is uh, Hector Rosunio. <laughs> <laughs> Just get up and say it's all going to be all right. <laughs> um, obtained his BA in community development from Portland State University and has worked for community based organizations and different, different government agencies. Hector believes that equity and sustainability are just words and that we must work to implement these ideals so that people of color and low-income communities can enjoy all the amenities, opportunities, and benefits needed for healthy, productive lives without being displaced from their neighborhoods. He is currently organizing around public transit with, transit with OPAL, organizing people activating leaders. All right, so hopefully I can bring you hope and encourage you at the same time. Um, what? Yep. Okay. <laughs> okay. A lot of times we tend to think that environmental degradation and hazards only impact our natural environment like forests, oceans, and animals. People depend on and need healthy and safe community environments where we live, work, play, and pray in order to survive. There is a direct cause and effect between the distribution of benefits and burdens of our decision making and the natural and human built environment. Environmental justice focuses on ensuring that all communities can live in a safe, healthy environment. During the 1980s, community activists began noticing that the placement of toxic waste dumps, landfills, and freeways near communities of color had a negative impact on the health and well-being. So in October of 1991, the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit was held in Washington, D.C. Those leaders recognized their environmental justice encompassed racial, economic, and social justice, and developed a number of principles that serve to guide our movement. Most important is to meaningfully impact decisions that will shape their lives and well-being. So while our, while our understanding of climate change was more limited 20 years ago, the leaders of color at the summit affirmed the sacredness of our planet and the right of, for all people to be free, from ecological harm and called for education of present and future generations on issues, on issues of social and environmental justice. The leaders of the First National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit challenged us all to make a conscious decision to prioritize our lifestyles to ensure the health of the natural world for present and future generations. Hence, individual responsibility from all of us in making personal and consumer choices to minimize consumption of our resources and to produce as little waste as possible. Environmental justice calls for a more equitable distribution of benefits and burdens. It's actually the path forward for climate justice by ensuring that all communities are forced to deal with the burdens of their consumer decisions. This could lead to a true reduction in consumption, which we absolutely need to do if we want to do anything meaningful on climate change. Transportation is one of one of the areas where many communities, even those that embrace green and sustainable life, continue to have a blind spot. Our current national transportation system, which prioritizes the automobile and reliance on fossil fuels, has many direct <laughs> adverse health consequences. Air toxics and pollution-related asthma, disincentives for physical activity, and the associated rise in obesity and chronic illnesses are just a few examples. Transportation options affect in health indirectly by connecting people to jobs, medical care, healthy food outlets, and other necessities. Opal Environmental Justice Oregon works on transit justice to ensure that a region, state, and country are making necessary investments in public transportation. Investing in transportation both generates opportunities for people who depend on transit for all their daily needs and provides, option to the, uh, provides options to the autocentric system 
that has dominated for decades and has contributed to our current climate disaster. Emissions from our transportation system is the number one contributor to greenhouse gases emissions in the state of Oregon. Yet we continue to disinvest in our transit system, raising fares, cutting service, and making it more difficult to access these choices and opportunity. This is particularly critical for immigrants who must learn to use the transit system so they can integrate into society. It is time that we get serious about our priorities and force the type of consumer decisions that we need to achieve a healthy and safe environment for all communities. In order to make progress in climate change, we must embrace meaningful changes in local scale. That signifies organizing people and activating leaders. If we as organizers do not provide hope and a vision to individuals, if we do not educate people, then we will not be able to pressure appointed officials. Hence, there will not be a strong political will to make decisions based on environmental justice principles. So with that, I will stop talking so we can have a discussion in terms of how we can create communities in which low income and people of color will have a right to a clean, affordable, and safe places for all people where we live, work, play, study, and pray. We're twenty. <laughs> great. So if we can give everyone a great big round. Of applause.